Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We have Banyan Gold presenting again, which is exciting because we had them in June, I believe it was uh, the last time that they presented. Uh, before we get started, as always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to see those, you can check them out on the company's website on their disclosures. And there will be a Q&A section at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom. With that out of the way, Tara Christie, CEO, is back joining us today to talk about Banyan Gold and what they've done this summer at their exploration project in the Yukon. So hi, Tara. Nice to see you. Hi, great to see you. And thank you to everyone for joining us. I see that there's a bunch of people who I, I know, shareholders and, and people who've joined us before. Appreciate you tuning in to get an update. And I will keep this a little bit light on the, the details of the story because I can see that so many of you are already following the story. And hopefully that'll give us a little bit more time for Q&A. So it's been an exciting year for Banyan. You know, putting out this resource in May, as you know, was pretty significant for us in showing that we really did have a significant deposit uh, at our ORMAC project. Um, with that 900,000 ounces, we always knew that um, and have said that we believe we can continue to grow both ounces and grade at ORMAC. Uh, and we set out this year to continue to do that. And of course, with Victoria Gold, just 40 kilometers down the road, with the same age of mineralization, it's really helped us to get attention. And when you look at our, our deposit, it's important to remember that if you were to increase the cutoff grade by 50%, the grade would go up to 0.65% and it would still remain in a pit mineable um, deposit. So, you know, this is a near surface on surface deposit with exceptional infrastructure located near two now, or one producing mine and Alexco going into production. So it's a pretty exciting jurisdiction to be in and, and with this coming gold market, I think we're gonna see a lot of excitement going into the fall. Our team, we're very focused on economic and mineable deposits, track record of success with that. Um, I'm really pleased with the work that our geological team is doing in the field, both Paul Gray and our operations manager, field manager, James Tom. He's one that went out there, you know, targeting the drill, getting the results back, and, uh, and definitely helping us move this project forward. You know, our board has an experience as well. Mark Aranto is with Victoria Gold right from the early days all the way through to operations today. And Steve Burleton and David Reed are certainly a big part of our success. They've both been in this business and been successful um, and will be really instrumental in helping us move forward. And of course, Sean Harvey, important advisor and a big uh, cheerleader for us, along with Clint Nauman at Alexco. Alexco has the right to a board seat, but Clint and his team have been invaluable technically and on the operational side, helping us to execute our programs efficiently and effectively. And their geological knowledge is certainly um, better than any other of, of the geology and the structure in the district, really gives us great value. So at the present day, uh, we have just around $5.7 million in the bank after our drill program to date, over 6,900 meters drill. You can see on that share, part, share price graph where we put out that resource in May, uh, certainly was an important catalyst for us and has been able to garner attention. Importantly though, our key investors, Victoria, Alexco, Cisco and Sprott, who helped us to finance in October of 2019. And again, in this most recent financing of $4.7 million, which is right around when we gave the last Adelaide Capital webinar. So uh, we're in a great position. That funds us all the way through 2021 with around 10,000 meters of drilling this year and 15,000 plus for next year. It is fabulous to be able to say and have committed to drills for already for next year. We already sent the email, yes, we want two drills. Uh, none of us know what the world's going to bring uh, with COVID and everything, but in the best case scenario, we'll start drilling in March, um, drill through to the to the melt when it gets really muddy, take a break and then continue to drill through the summer, adding the second drill after the, uh, the spring melt. So really exciting time for us and certainly we're positioned really well. The other advantage we have um, is being in the Yukon. The Yukon is a great place from, uh, from a COVID perspective. Uh, they've done a good job managing it in terms there are, there was only uh, one current active case which is a non-resident of the Yukon that traveled to the Yukon. Um, through this whole process, mining being an essential service has been important for allowing us all to continue to operate. We started in June um, and people are really noticing the Yukon with both Victoria Gold and Alexco going into production. The Tintina Belt has been well known 
Uh, but really the Yukon side of it has been quite underexplored and with the recent mines being permitted and going into construction and operation, I think people can see that the Yukon's a jurisdiction where you can take a project the, the whole distance. And that's, that's pretty important. So here we are right beside uh, Victoria Gold and, and Alexco to the north. You can see the orange land package, which was the 92 kilometers uh, square kilometers of ORMAC, which we had when I gave the last webinar. The areas in red are our ORMAC expansion and our new nitro property. We believe these are key pieces of ground for us. They have both the geological attributes that we think are similar to airstrip and power line, and they also give us an expanded land package for other potential infrastructure, roads, et cetera, in the future, particularly on ORMAC. So, you know, we're in a, in a jurisdiction of giants with Victoria Gold right beside us. Um, saw some of their early drill results from their Nugget and Raven. Um, I'm excited to see what comes out of there as well. It shows that this is a really big system. The same system that created the gold at Victoria Gold is what we're seeing at Ormac. Same age of mineralization, slightly different rocks that it's in, but, you know, it shows that it was a very long-lived system. And we're beside another big system that produced the 300 million ounces plus of silver, which is just to the north of us. So our property is in a great jurisdiction. You know, a general explorer rule of thumb is look uh, close to an existing mine to find another mine. Um, so our nitro property, we're gonna do a limited amount of work this year with soil sampling and targeting, uh, really continuing with our drilling effort on the Ormac property. So, you know, we're continuing to use our shareholders dollars very well, but we are ramping up. We're starting to get ready for fall and spring drilling, which requires preparation um, from a safety perspective, looking after your equipment. Uh, we, we completed drilling this last term and we took a week off and we're just about to ramp drilling back up uh, after taking a bit of time to do maintenance and, and get ready for winter time. The Yukon, in this part of the Yukon, we also have a settled First Nation. They have businesses which uh, supply the mining industry. We've been very importantly engaging with them and continuing to use their services and ramp up uh, with uh, our communications with the First Nation, which is very important. So now, you know, drilled over 6,900 meters, less than a third of the results have come out um, yet. And we're expecting to have news flow now continuously through 2021. So here's that resource. Again, the infrastructure is, is a key importance. Airstrip and power line have that main power line uh, through them, which is over on the left-hand side of your screen crisscrossed by the main highway. The new power line is actually in construction right now. They're upgrading this line that you see right uh, on the left-hand side with the double the capacity line. And, and it's not just a political promise, the poles are actually going in as we speak, and we're told the line should be energized before Christmas. So that's really exciting for us, both from a reliability and a future capacity perspective. This uh, the squared area, recall, is, is uh, Victoria Gold substation. And this road, which has the sharp curve, is actually their access road. It's a Yukon government road, but it's year-round maintained. And the key part of these roads is that this is what's going to enable us to continue to efficiently drill through the fall here. Um, even though there's snow, this access is unparalleled uh, with, with other companies. You know, we can short little distances off this road to drill power line and airstrip. We can both do safely and efficiently continuing into the fall. We also have engaged in metallurgy. Um, we've, we've hired Forte uh, Analytical out of Denver. They're the same group that's working with Victoria Gold on their metallurgy. We're working really closely with uh, Alexco. They have a very brilliant metallurgist on staff. They have the experience of having worked at, uh, at Brewery Creek and run and operated heat leach mines, as well as Victoria Gold with what they're doing now with grade reconciliation. So, that gives us a tremendous advantage in our metallurgical program to have people that know this area and also understand what it takes to, to not just do metallurgy, but to do metallurgy that will make this project uh, potentially attractive uh, from a mining perspective and having the right database and information available. We also flew a LIDAR survey, uh, particularly on our expanded land package. That's a key part of targeting, seeing some of the structures uh, and having that information. We're going to engage in some additional geophysics to help us with targeting. We found that's been very effective, particularly around uh, the airstrip and community relations. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But in the context of COVID, I think that's something that all mining companies have to rethink and continue to engage and make sure that the community hears from them. So it's something that we're uh, actively working on. 
So here are the first batch or first two sets of, of uh, results that we put out. This is just the highlights of the highlights uh, from both of those two press releases. And I just wanted to speak to them a little bit and, and show the significance of them. So if you look on the, in the image where MQ2066 is, that's almost a hundred meter step out. And then going to 67 is another hundred meter step out. So that alone adds 200 meters of strike length to the west. So um, pretty significant and we we're really pleased with that. We also know that hole 73 had some significant mineralization and is highlighted here as one of our, uh, or one section from it. The hole 69 here and 72, those were really difficult ground condition holes, uh, quite deep overburden. Um, and so 69, we actually didn't even drill uh, into rock. Uh, we decided to move over uh, because of uh, the ground condition. So, you know, it's, it's not all easy where you pick where you want to drill, um, but certainly, you know, we've got some great targets to continue to expand out to the west. We're seeing strong mineralization in 73 here, and we do think we can continue to, to step out to the west. We took pretty bold step outs too with 100 meter step outs. Uh, and then you can see hole 82, which also had an exciting uh, step out from 1834, which we previously had, um, you know, great grade of 0.74 of 113 meters there. Uh, that's pretty uh, important, 125 meter step out down dip to the south. Uh, we think we can continue to see that mineralization. The one outstanding hole that we have from airstrip is 83, which you can again see is a pretty big step out to the south. Uh, we wanted to take a few bolder step outs uh, on this program. Uh, while we had the opportunity, we know we're going to be able to come back this fall um, because of these roads and drill some of the easier holes and holes which are better to drill uh, when it's frozen. Some of this area is quite swampy, so you know we'll continue to drill out some of this near surface material, which will be part of the pit um, in the fall. We'll drill some more holes over to the west here. Uh, which we know we'll continue to be able to add ounces and we'll continue to add over here in the, um, the south and eastern portion as well. So uh, lots of plans to drill more holes here. We didn't drill our best targets necessarily first. We wanted to do some important step outs as well as uh, uh, really give ourselves a broader area that we can work on through the, the fall and the winter uh, and know that we're going to be adding ounces. We drilled 18 holes at Airstrip in the first phase here, seven at Powerline and 11 at Orex Hill. And then we also drilled one hole about 1.2 kilometers to the east of here, which was a pure exploration hole. We thought it looked very similar to Airstrip uh, and we're excited to see what the results of that might be because it's a pretty significant step out if we can see any continuity in mineralization uh, that far away from the Airstrip. A power line, um, we drilled uh, those holes primarily going both north and south. And then we drilled over towards airstrip. As you can see here, we drilled over and then we've uh, drilled roughly this area of this cross now. Um, we'll have some updated drill maps on that in the next couple of weeks. Um, we haven't finished cutting all of those holes yet. We're getting them to the lab. Uh, that is in process. and. Uh, and as we're able to get them, we're able to ship them to the lab. There's quite regular trips from, our, from the area. There's, it's a busy area being with Victoria Gold and Alexco right beside us. Uh, so those will get to the lab shortly. So you can see this Oryx Hill area and why we were so excited about it. The airstrip in this inset box just at the top of the map, that blue area, that's about 1.2 kilometers in length. That's the airstrip resource projected on the surface. Below here is the power line, this green block, that's the power line. This Oryx Hill target is 10, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers roughly. It's a huge annular gold and arsenic anomaly. We have previous uh, holes, diamond drill holes here with up to eight grams and some of these, you know, 0.5 over broader intervals uh, in some of the historic holes. And this map really was to highlight the rab drill results. Um, which you can see here are also pretty exciting showing near surface mineralization that 40 meters of 1.18 um, that's pretty exciting. We're fairly confident that this area looks very similar to Powerline and we think we're going to be able to put together another near surface resource here. So we drilled from Powerline roughly stepping out 100 meters uh, and over into this area. Lots of targets here to drill for, for next year 
It's a little bit uh, more topography here and muddy, so a little bit less of a, a good target for drilling through the fall and the spring. But certainly as we get into summer next year, this will be a target that we get back at. And this information is going to help us to, to design our program for next year. Our programs, we always adapt based on not getting our results back. The lab delays have been a little bit challenging from that perspective, but really we have enough time. We've got these three target areas plus a few exploration areas. We can go back to airstrip and drill for a very long time before we'd need the power line results to guide us moving over there. And because they're right beside the highway, it's really easy, very short moves. That's a kilometer between airstrip and power line. It'll be short and easy to, to move around and uh, put our holes where we think we'll get the most value uh, going through the winter. And also have to think about, you know, when the, when the ground is frozen in some of these swampy areas, that's the optimal time to be drilling uh, a few of these locations. Less environmental damage and, uh, and, and ultimately less stress for everybody involved. So here's also those images showing our geochem. And really just the story here is huge land package. We have a lot of work to do here uh, with our new 156 square kilometers uh, at Ormac proper itself. Uh, I can now say we've drilled less than 1% of it, so it truly is underexplored. Uh, you can see those zones that are our targets again. Um, I talked about airstrip power line and Oryx Hill, the, those historic areas where the prospector took out the two ounce material, still a target we intend to follow up on. And as we go west in the power in the airstrip zone, uh, we'll certainly be able to test a few of our targets structurally related to that. Um, looking for the buried intrusive or, or understanding where all this mineralization is coming from certainly um, is, is also part of the story and, and the geophysics, the LIDAR, all help with us in that story. And then the Keno Hill Silver story. Uh, you know, we, we did have Keno Hill style mineralization coming through and veins of it through the airstrip. Um, at some point, we'll start to follow, think about that and following up to see if we have any significant silver targets on the property. So you can see just from the geochem coverage, we have a lot of work to do for basic soil sampling. That'll be next summer. Uh, certainly get some, some additional soil coverage out while we're drilling for next year as well. So, you know, ESG, lots of juniors don't get to ESG till they're well into starting the permitting process. We've started our baseline environmental work. We started our metallurgy. So we are positioning this project to move forward. And that means that, you know, we have the ES, E under control, we need to make sure um, we have the social part of it under control. And in a COVID context, that's a little bit challenging. Um, yes, we employ locally. Yes, we're using the First Nation businesses. Uh, but really, how do you engage and communicate, you know, emails and Zooms? And, and we're lucky that we have a good existing relationship so people know who we are when we phone, uh, and that helps. Uh, but we also are, are really engaged and passionate in some of the work that we're doing that, that impacts the community, such as our Every Student Every Day charity that we work on very closely with Victoria Gold. Been quite engaged in that this last week, getting ready for our online auction that's happening right now and our live auction on Saturday. And anybody can log into that, so please uh, think about uh, uh, taking a look at what we have. Um, you know, this is a 100% volunteer effort from Banyan. And, um, and uh, all those involved. So it's certainly a great cause to support. Also involved in other organizations in the Yukon and uh, you know, making sure that we're doing things right environmentally, safety and training as we're bringing on new people and planning big programs for next year and even for all drilling, we've taken quite proactive measures at making sure that our staff are properly trained and will have a safe working uh, season this year and next. So our Highland project, we did a quick trip out there this year um, just to check on things. We have two camps out there and equipment. Um, someday we'll get back to doing the geology here. We do like this project. Um, you can see the, these trenches in mineralization, this deposit, you know, we, we think has multi-million ounce potential. Um, very small fraction of this land package has been had modern exploration, really just the main zone, which you can see here. And, and then that extension that we've drilled 1.2 uh, kilometers to the north. Um, land package is 186 square kilometers. So, you know, it didn't make sense this year to divide our effort between two locations, either from COVID or financially. Uh, but, you know, this property, we know that four and eight kilometers, there's known golden arsenic anomalies that look very similar to the main zone. Um, 
has a road, so road accessible, near surface, potentially open pit, mineable project as well. 86% recoveries from the column leach test. So uh, when you look at Victoria Gold at 0.63 grams per ton as their average grade, and their metallurgical recovery was 74%, uh, you know, this project is starting to look a little more exciting in this gold market. I think we continue to see a re-rate. You know, our team is very systematically uh, drilling to add ounces to look for new target areas. I think we'll be continue to be re-rated uh, with the strong gold prices and, and as we start to get results through the fall and, and into 2021, uh, I don't think the economics in the world are gonna change with all the money that's been printed personally. And yes, I make lots of forward looking statements, but it's certainly been a, a challenging environment, but a great, environment for gold explorers and we're doing everything we can to continue to position this project to be an attractive target um, you know at two million ounces in, in the yukon if we could get it to that i think it would be a very compelling for many different suitors um, either our two mine any of the miners that are in our registry already which we think we have three potential suitors uh, but also for other companies that are looking at the Yukon. And, and I think more companies are going to be looking at the Yukon uh, for a safe jurisdiction where you can actually permit and build a mine. Uh, we've got an exceptionally well-positioned project right in the middle of a fabulous infrastructure and we'll now have news flow going through 2021. So, so that's the main story. Tried to keep it a little briefer today so we could answer more questions because we ran out of time last time. Thank you, Tara. We have one question from the audience. Um, what density per meter, tons per meter cubed, is being used to calculate the resource? Oh gosh, I have to go back and check that. Um, I was just looking at Highland, so I'll have to get back on that. I just can't remember this particular second. <laughs> That's fine. It's from Doc Jones, who I'm assuming you know. Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> so we'll follow up. Oh. I still get nervous at these things, believe it or not. Over email. Um, and so just uh, to clarify, when do you expect to update the resource? You know, we're not in a rush to do that. Um, you know, often it's perceived when somebody upstates their resource that that's all there is. Um, we're continuing to step out. You know, we were successful stepping out to the west, to the south. Um, we'll wait and see what we get from Powerline. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty well funded now, so, you know, we can add a lot of 15,000 meters next year, the 10,000 meters this year, that's, that's more drilling than we've done in the whole history of this property. Um, so, it, I'm not going to rush to update it, um, just because, you know, the market wants you to put out a resource. So, I don't think it would, the, the earliest we would even think about it would be at the end of next year. And of the 10,000 meters, how many have you done to date this season? 6,900 meters. Okay. And you're still waiting on a number of assays? We are still cutting core to send it to the lab <laughs> from the last drilling. So, uh, and then of course, we're just starting back up again after a, a break. We generally work 28 days and then take a one week break. We've had one drill crew all season, which is great from a COVID perspective and also from a continuity perspective. They're the same drill team we had last year, uh, or drillers. Uh, helpers have been a little bit harder to find in the Yukon. There's so much, um, so much uptake from our employment from Victoria Gold and Alexco and, and uh, many of the other drilling companies with all the activity that it is a little bit hard to find people. Yeah, I think that's a common problem in that region right now. Um, are there any environmental issues such as water or animal pathways? You know, we're in a highly disturbed area, um, you know, with the, and lots of infrastructure already in it. Um, so there was quite a bit of disturbance before we got there. Um, so right where we're drilling, you know, I don't anticipate there's anything in airstrip or power line uh, or even Oryx Hill that's significant. We, we did do a heritage resources study on the, um, on the property before we permitted and, and we're doing that on our expanded property. Um, and we also have access to Alexco and Victoria's uh, data from the environment from their applications, which included quite a bit of regional data, as well as the Yukon government's data on wildlife. And there's nothing in that that we've seen so far that indicates there's anything on our property that we need to be concerned about, and particularly in any of the areas where we're actively drilling. Okay. 
We had a question about what mining equipment's presently on site for operation and what equipment's being considered or appropriated for progressing test operation. Um, I know you and I discussed this before. It sounded like it was more geared towards a development co stage company, but maybe you can address sort of where you're at in this stage of delineation. Sure, yeah, we're still in the exploration phase. So, um, you know, we do have a, an excavator and a small bulldozer excavator, um, as well as a, a D6, but we're not in the operational phase yet. And we're really focused on low ground disturbance. Uh, so we have some, like a, rather than building a road, we used a track piece of equipment to get back and forth to the drill, which means we don't have to build a road. It's also good for using on the snow. Um, so that, uh, um, we don't have any large earth moving equipment at this point. We might bring in some larger excavators for some trenching uh, probably next year, but that, uh, you know, that wouldn't really be for operations. We are working on getting a camp together. Currently we stay in Alexco's camp, but one of the lessons that COVID's taught us is that you really need to be independent as well to make sure that your destiny is always in your own hands. Um, Alexco has been fabulous to work with and, and we, um, they've accommodated us again this year. Uh, but certainly having redundancy and being able to isolate your crew and have isolation quarters um, for if somebody gets sick, um, you know, that we just need to expand our ability to do that. So we're looking into that now. And what would the timeline be on that sort of expansion next season? Yeah, that's, um, you know, we want to have, we, we already have in place um, a accommodation so we can put people if they get sick and separate them from our main crew, um, which was a requirement really to be operating this year um, and you know we could accommodate more people um, but really it is we're looking for the when we bring the second drill in next year we need to have additional accommodations uh, that are our own in order to house that it's a bit of a limitation now uh, because you know with COVID and how accommodation is set up and having that redundancy it's a little challenging it's not a usual problem you have for uh, for drilling but that's that's operating in this new modern environment. So it does pose a few problems. Okay. And um, are you fully permitted into 2021? Do you have all the drill permits you need? So we are fully permitted on for ORMAC, the original ORMAC, um, which we had staked. The new ground that we have just staked this year, we have what's called the class one on it, which does allow us to do whatever work we've applied for on it, but we will be applying for an amendment to our um, ORMAC permit over the fall. And you know, I wanna make sure that I've, I've talked to stakeholders and, and uh, I'm doing that work now in advance of submitting our applications, as well as a permit for drilling on our Nitra property. But we are fully permitted to continue to drill airstrip, power line, or exhale. And yeah, about 92 square kilometers. Okay. And what is the turnaround time for submitting assays to a press release update? How often can we expect, expect press releases right now? So uh, those are all good questions. So the lab gives about a standard time of four weeks. And then after that, it's overdue. And we've had numerous um, times when uh, assays have been overdue. And you know we're following up and working with the lab on that. And the other problem with it is you don't always get your results back in order. So you get like a partial hole and then you probably noticed it and there was a bit of a mix that things weren't in sequence in our first press release and our second press release but that's because of when the results come back and not having complete holes or or needing to do additional qa qc before um, you uh, put out the results so you know we try to get our results out as quick as possible uh, but once you get the results you do have to do the process of <clears throat> quality control and then you know, we like to make sure we're understanding what we're putting out, um, look at various intervals, uh, see how it fits with our models, get some maps done. So, you know, generally for us, <clears throat> certainly within a week or so that we try to put out results between having received them. Don't like people to have information for too long either. Um, so, but it is a balance with the field season too. We've had a very small crew and we're now growing a little bit. So we do have more capacity to, to do, you know, be working on maps and things when it's not taking away from drilling. For us, uh, July and, and August, you know, we, we didn't have a full crew. Um, we wanted to take our time and find a really you know, good crew in additions to our team. And, and we've done that now. So we no longer have that capacity problem. 
Um, so in terms of how often you'll see it, it, it is dependent on when we get lab results, which is not 100% in my control, <clears throat> but it'll be as regularly as we can. You know, certainly our next release, we want to have that final hole from Airstrip and then enough holes from Powerline to put together a, a meaningful story. Um, you know, we aren't going to put out one or two holes. Uh, that, that's not a, necessarily a good use of everybody's time. Uh, we know that we're, we've got a bigger story to tell and uh, we're going to successfully you know, put out releases through the fall um, as we're able. Okay, and I have another question on timelines for an updated resource estimate. Mm -hmm. um, so how long will it take to produce one based on the results of the current drill campaign? I know you're not giving yourself a timeline, but if you kept up at the same level of drilling through next year, what would be a reasonable timeline, do you think? Well, you know, we keep up with the model itself as we get our results. And, and our QP was already up this fall, um, who wrote the resource. He was going up to Victoria Gold. And so, you know, we've already had him do a visit of what we've seen at Powerline and RX Hill. So that's not a constraint for us. I don't think it would take a long time because it's not like we're adding brand new areas or new geology. We're simply adding to an existing um, known deposit. So it's it's really the availability of the QP which might be more of a concern and as long as we're keeping up on the model and um, um, not adding something brand new in a brand new location um, you know it's it's not a complicated process uh, you know our, it was pretty efficient on the last go wrong it didn't take us very long once we had all the results uh, to get I think it was like two months and all the work was done after we had the results back okay and we talked about drill permitting. Where are you in the overall permitting process? And also congratulations to you, Mark, and the team from Ronald. <laughs> um, where are we in the permitting process? So we have, um, I think, eight years left on our exploration permit. Uh, it's a pretty robust exploration permit that we have that we envision um, you know, when you put in a permit, you have to think about how much exploration you might do. So we did uh, consider a significant amount of drilling, uh, both diamond drilling and RC in that permit. Um, but to go to the next phase, so after that permit expires, we would either have to renew it, um, or if, you know, you were to go into um, potentially uh, permitting for operations of some type, that, that does require a whole new application. We're not there yet though. We've got a long way to go with the permit that we have. I think a lot of work done under it. <laughs> I think it was two or 300,000 meters of drilling in total we had permitted, so it's quite a bit. Would you consider expanding the current drill program? Um, how long will the season go this year? We're currently contemplating about November, so that's late fall. Um, you know, it gets darkest. The darkest days are, are really December, January, February. Uh, it's been a long year for everybody this year. Uh, we would rather take a break for the, the winter during the coldest and darkest months this year and give all our people a break, give our time to properly target, prepare, get the additional equipment that we need and be ready for next year to start in, in say March, barring no other strange world events like we saw this year in March. Um, and then, you know, really hit next year strong, good targets, uh, refreshed crew. Uh, you could drill through the winter and, you know, they've done it at Victoria Gold and I've been involved in, in winter drilling, true winter, um, but I don't think it would be tremendously efficient uh, and, and given where we are right now, we've chosen to take a break. Okay. And then just going back to um, sort of maybe a more strategy um, question. So you stated that Banyan could be a target for bigger producers. Is this an objective or the plan, or is the plan more to develop uh, Banyan as Victoria did these past years, become a producer and obviously look at uh, offers during the process? I guess the crux of it is, are you planning on being miners or explorers? I'm an explorer. You know, I have the, uh, I believe that our team of me at the helm has the ability to get this um, grow the resource, feasibility study, start permitting, get it through potentially. But really, I think personally, the Yukon's going to be a very exciting place with Victoria Gold right beside us um, and other people looking for ounces. Um, I, I do believe it, is, it will be a takeout target. 
Um, I'm not going to, you know, say we Banyan couldn't because Victoria Gold did it. Um, they had the exact same management team. If this team were to do that, we would we would need to have different skill sets. And you saw Victoria Gold change their board. They hired on different uh, uh, skill sets to make sure they had the right skill set. So you know that's that's way far in the future. And I personally don't want to build mine. I've seen how painful it is and how how much expertise it takes and all the things that go wrong. You really need. Um, a skilled person to be a meeting that's built a mine before. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm a 6% shareholder almost in Banyan. So I'm quite happy if the time comes that, that um, somebody wants to acquire this company or take over uh, or find the right person to, to manage it, that uh, I make my money through my equity. Uh, so I'm pretty aligned with our shareholders and wanting to look at all the best options uh, for our shareholders to get value. We know we can continue to add ounces, so we're not in a rush to do anything. Uh, but all these deposits from what we've seen this year, from the results we have, uh, really continue to show that things are open and growing. Um, and our, my immediate target is to get to where people can see that we have that 2 million ounce threshold on the property. And uh, I think that would be a, that's a great near term target. And if we can get that uh, and through 2021, uh, I think that will be a game changer again for Ben. And is that the point at which you would open the data shack to entertain bids offers? Yeah, you know, we haven't talked about when we would open the, the data shack for, for bids and offers. You know, you have to consider it. You have an obligation to consider anything that comes your way uh, if it's good value for shareholders. So uh, we'll we'll approach that when those those occurrences happen. Just you don't have a target ounce in mind. Um, not at the present time, you know, that 2 million ounces, I think is significant for the Yukon. So that is where our next step, I think, is. And in markets and the way things, uh, um, it's a very dynamic business, the mining business. So, you know, what you think today uh, might be different than depending on what happens with the world economics than, than what we all think at Christmas or January. Uh, I think January could be a very different time uh, myself than our, than our usual mining markets. Well, we've certainly learned that this year. <laughs> um, do you have any CAs signed with any companies? Are you willing to disclose that? Um, I'm not sure if you're supposed to dis disclose whether you have CAs. Um, you know, it's uh, we do uh, we do talk to lots of companies. I've had numerous meetings at uh, these uh, conf online conferences and. You know, Beaver Creek, I think I had 61 meetings and uh, some of them were with larger mining companies who've expressed interest in continuing to have conversations. So um, I don't think it's a secret. There's lots of people looking for gold deposits and, and the Yukon's a, a, a desirable jurisdiction. Okay. And then switching gears a little bit, um, just talking about what type of mining you envision being done on the property eventually. Um, do you expect this to be heat leach? That's our present, yeah. That's exactly what the resource is built on. So it's a pit constrained resource, which envisions open pit heat leach mining, very similar to Victoria Gold, low strip ratio, you know, the mineralization comes weak to surface. It's a, so looking at airstrip, you know, it's amenable to heat leach mining because it's a big thick package of pervasively mineralized rock, um, you know, that, that 0.5 to one gram we saw the, that over 50 meters, but up to 110 meters thick in some areas. So that's something that's that's pretty amenable to heat leach mining because there's not a lot of, of waste within it. It all seems to be fairly consistent. So um, that's very different from you know narrow veins, which are harder to um, extract um, and potentially mine because you get lots of dilution. Depends on what, how they're oriented, how you mine them. So. That's why we envision it being open, like open pit heat leach mine starting right from surface. And how do you um, get around the challenges of operating a heat bleach operation in the winter? Well, we've got a neighbor down the road that's uh, showing us how to do it. And they, I got advice from an, another uh, Alaskan company, Fort Knox, Kinross's Fort Rock, Knox properties operated all through the winter. Uh, Victoria Gold uh, is currently looking at going to year round stacking. So uh, there's lots of precedents for operating in the north, particularly having, having infrastructure so close to us, power and um, 
and roads makes it uh, more economic than uh, lots of other locations which are more remote. And do you have a sense of what kind of strip ratio you might be looking at? We're, you know, kind of looking at the one-to-one -one similar to Victoria Gold. And you look at the, the, uh, the uh, model and you can see it on our website. We have that 3D digital model and you can turn off the pit and kind of see how it's constrained. And of course, the holes that we drill this year are going to add to that. A lot of what we're going to drill in the next phase, particularly to the north, um, are that real near surface area that where the pit extends where we don't have uh, any drill holes there to indicate that there's any mineralization there. Um, so those, those will certainly add ounces and also near surface ounces. And then, you know, as we came south, we're drilling more down dip, which is, uh, is you know, would require a higher strip ratio because it's this body going down, you've got this portion which is non-mineralized on top. So, you know, it's a bit of a balance between going north and adding kind of near surface ounces and, and east and west adding overall, you know, tracing where this mineralization goes and then going south and, you know, at some point we won't chase a depth because of the strip ratio, so. Okay, got it. And your cost of finding ounces in the ground has been about $2 per. Do you expect that to be consistent or do you think that's going to change over time? Uh, it, it probably will change over time, um, partly because of COVID added a little cost for everybody. Um, not a huge amount, but some. Uh, also, we're going to be going into this later fall uh, drilling and spring drilling, which does add some cost, uh, fuel and, and additional safety measures, etc. So it is, um, you know, I, I can't guarantee we're going to be that low cost, but we're still being very efficient with shareholder dollars. Every purchase we make uh, and uh, where we move the drill, we try to be as efficient as possible. Uh, so that we're really maximizing what we're getting out of the ground. So far, we've been, you know, ground conditions other than the whole 69 with the deep overburden uh, have been pretty favorable to us. Uh, some of these muddy and swampy areas, you know, drilling them in summer would add a lot of cost. Uh, that's why we want to drill them in the winter. Um, so we're still being frugal. We intend to be, you know, one of the lowest cost explorers out there. And, uh, and then, you know, the other factor in, in staying low cost is do you get out and drill some of your pure exploration targets where uh, you know you could really add value if you find additional areas where you have mineralization very similar to power line it was a brand new discovery in 29 2019 but if we hadn't taken the chance to go and drill a place where we didn't know there was mineralization we wouldn't have found that deposit so it is a trade-off between adding ounces cheaply to also looking around and potentially finding something that might even be more exciting power lines great it's 0.61 um, that was pretty exciting and it wasn't previously known. Okay. And just going back to something that you said earlier about your 2 million ounce target, just to clarify, we have a question asking why you would sell at 2 million ounces when you may have a 5 million ounce potential on the property. Wouldn't you want to prove the resource out for at least a couple of years before selling? Do you want to clarify your strategy yeah. a little bit? So no, that, that was just my initial target where I think that um, it will be a very interesting target to lots of companies. And that's really based on what Victoria Gold had in reserves when they, they built in a mine. You know, that was kind of a key threshold for them to get to. And you always make a decision at some point, you've built a resource, you know, you have to start infilling to upgrade it eventually to a reserve when you're doing your, your feasibility study. So, um, you know, that trade-off of deciding when you've explored enough uh, and the deposit is big enough, I think you're gonna to have to start making that call once you can see around two million ounces. I didn't say I would sell it at two million ounces. Uh, it depends on, on whether it's really a good deal for our shareholders or not uh, at that time. Okay, great. And going back again to more questions on M&A. So uh, from one Participant, uh, Victoria seems like an obvious potential suitor here. Is there a strong case for them expanding their operation or might Banyan's ounces be more likely to come into play at the end of their li mine life? I guess the question is, is it, in terms of Victoria, would they view it as a standalone or a bolt-on? So that's, I, I can't speak for them because I don't know what they think, but um, you know, it, there are, scenarios where you could build a heat leach pad at, at, at ormac and you know put in a pipeline to 
to, uh, you know, potentially pipe solutions for their already existing facilities. You know, going from a, a two million, two hundred thousand, or two thirty, I think they're going to be a producer to adding some multiple of that is is probably something that would be within their growth horizon if that's what they're planning to do is to become a larger producer. And you know, with these gold prices, if they continue into the fall, they're going to have very significant cash flow. Um, and so, yeah, they are going to be looking for acquisitions. They've been reading their presentations. You see that they are doing internal exploration and chose to spend a significant amount of money this year on their links and nugget targets, which are, are pretty exciting near surface high grade deposits. Um, but at some point, if we have something that's down the road that's already further along in the resource, you know, they're likely to start to think about what else they're looking at. I, I think Alexco would also look at it. They, the principal behind Alexco have uh, built heap leach mines before. Cisco is another one of our shareholders and, you know, they, they know the value of, of heap leach projects. Um, so, you know, it, my key shareholders are also going to be pretty important when and if we get people looking at, at uh, Ormac to take it over. Um, there, I've got three parties that already are going to also be advocating along with other shareholders that, that they get fair value uh, for it because otherwise they would probably do something. So, you know, that might be the other thing that comes into play is somebody else comes along and, and forces the hand of another party looking at things that happens all the time at m and <laughs> That's the yeah. scenario. I mean, there's, there's been some surprising um, like suitors come into situations that you wouldn't expect them. And I think we are headed into an M&A cycle in the gold space. So who knows what can happen? I had a question specifically about Osisco royalties and the game plan for their investment in Banyan. Yeah. Are you one of their accelerator companies? That is how it was explained to me. So it's purely an equity investment. In 2019, we pitched to the, the Cisco technical team based on the merits of, of what we thought we saw at Ormac and that we planned to put together a resource. Um, so they made a modest, and you know, their first investment was just $300,000. And, uh, and then they made an additional investment in this last financing of, of equity as well. So I think we delivered on what we said we were gonna do for them and they, they made another investment. And it's certainly great to have uh, their technical team uh, vetting our project and also giving us a little bit of tips here and there. You've got a great shareholder base. I mean, I think it speaks to the quality of the management team and the project. Um, speaking of the management team, I've got a question for you and I'm not sure how you're going to handle this one. Okay. But um, Tara, you're a large shareholder. What market cap would you favor Banyan for personally cashed out? For personally cashing out? He acknowledges you probably can't answer. How rich do you want to get, Tara? What's your price? <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I don't know how to answer that one. I, um, I guess what would what you think, based on the drilling that you've done, where you're at, obviously you want to add more shareholder value before you were to seriously consider an offer, but what do you think the value of the company is? Well, I still think we're pretty undervalued. You know, looking at our other peers, you could look at it, what have other companies been bought out at, what prices, and you know, look at Camelac, what were they bought out at, and, and that wasn't in this strong of a gold market. Um, so there's some direct comparables where you can look at, say, well, that's how many ounces they had, that's what was paid per ounce. And I think, you know, there is a curve, more ounces, you get paid more per ounce. Um, and then infrastructure, so uh, I think you can look at various, but that's not how I think. I, I. Uh, yeah, I, I think more about adding value and what we're going to do next. And you know, it's not what drives me. I don't get up in the morning thinking about that. I get up thinking about, um, you know, what we're going to do next, where the, the most exciting places, how we're going to get there, uh, the people that we're hiring, the community that we're benefiting, um, you know, that bigger picture. Uh, we're adding value for shareholders. We're adding value for UConn and for the community um, is more kind of my my way of thinking um yeah it's uh but i guess i should think about that at some point so i can answer your question better <laughs> well i don't think anyone could answer that one directly uh without getting a call from the regulators <laughs> talking about the yukon and adding value there what is the website for your every student every day ch charity silent auction uh it's on givergy.ca esed slash okay. esed it's um on that slide and um, I think you can see it in all of our social media tweets. We're pretty proud of our, our involvement, having given out over $800,000 uh, from the charity. We work very closely with Victoria Gold. We have lots of sponsors all across the 
including the Cisco Arai, and they're all long-term sponsors. So uh, it, it also allows us to collaborate with all of them on something that's benefiting the community. Uh, this year alone, we're giving out $150,000 to, to over 21 projects all across the Yukon. So it's not just the Mayo area. So, uh, you know, it's really taking momentum. And I think everybody knows as a parent, I'm, I'm a parent that has kids going back to school that this has been tough. This has been tough on kids. It's been tough on families and getting back to school is a whole, whole new thing. So, you know, we're providing support to communities, First Nations and schools, helping kids get back to school. So. Well, you've got a great project. I love your focus on ESG and cost saving. I think you're doing a really good job progressing it both within the community and um, at a, a cheap cost to shareholders. So I don't see any other questions. I'm just gonna check my email while I do that, Tara. Maybe you can sort of summarize what is Banyan Gold? What catalysts can we look for over the coming months? Great. And so, how, do we, how do we measure you? Give us some uh, metrics to create a report card. <laughs> oh, great, now I gotta do my own report card. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think you'll continue to see us uh, add ounces at both Airstrip and Powerline. We will have news flow through the fall and into the spring and Yes, it's a little delayed now, but that probably means it'll go longer into the spring, uh, which is usually where we see gold prices up. So that's probably you know, not going to be a bad thing to have drill results out early in the new year. Um, we're pretty excited with those step outs that we've seen at Airstrip. We don't have the results back from Powerline to say the same thing, but they're pretty significant step outs of 200 meters and 125 meters to the south. When we get back to the drilling that we plan for this fall to the north, uh, in that area, we, we didn't touch at all in the, the first part of our drilling uh, and uh, continue to the west uh, as well as the south and the east. I think you'll see us continue to deliver on that uh, with decent results. Um, same with Powerline and Oryx Hill. Uh, our, our, we're quite excited about what we're seeing at Oryx Hill, uh, where we've drilled you know, basically a power line. Oryx Hill is a kilometer from Powerline and right on strike with Powerline. Um, you know, they very well might be connected. Um, and that could be very exciting because uh, what we saw at Powerline, of course, is, is higher, higher grade. So right now our focus really is uh, expanding and we're taking some big step outs like that, that drill hole that was 1.2 kilometers from airstrip, on strike with airstrip. That's a pretty big step out, uh, but it's also an exciting target. And if you test your model um, and you have some success, you, know, you can really show that this is much bigger. And that is our goal to show that there is that 2 million ounce potential here in the short term, and that there's multi-million ounce potential in the long term. Um, so stay focused on that for 2020. Uh, 2021, um, you know, we'll also build ounces, but there might be different stories to tell as we go into the new year, depending on, on what results we get uh, through this year. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions, so if the audience doesn't have any more, I don't have any more either. Um, thanks so much for joining us today, Tara. Congratulations. Since we last spoke, you've had a successful capital raise. You've had a successful drill program that's ongoing. Um, so congrats. I think you timed the market pretty well, too. Um, seems to be that we're in a more volatile time right now um so yeah thank you so much and thank you to everyone for participating if you do have any other questions for tara feel free to reach out to myself or tara directly oh i see one coming in oh just a comment and that's a good way to end it he's a very happy shareholder so keep up the great work <laughs> and i'll reiterate that i'm a i'm a happy shareholder too tara <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your support and the support in the financing and in the market. You know, we really do appreciate it. And we are, uh, you know, every day we think about how we're adding shareholder value and spending shareholders dollars well. So thank you.